Please be seated. Thank you, Bryson. What a great weekend. What a great week. What a great God we serve. Amen, church? So many wonderful things going on. This past Friday night, I mean, you had to move around town to catch it all. Here at our central branch, Celebrate Recovery, that's every Friday night. I am continually amazed at the folks that are just coming, that have no connection regarding relationship at this church, but they hear about through somebody, through somewhere that something is going on, and they come in our doors. If you walked in down by the chapel on Friday night, that's what you walked into. What I loved was the 150 who tried to walk in, that we, is this the Memorial High School baseball team banquet? No, that's on the other end of the building. And there were folks down there loving and welcoming and being hospitable to the Memorial High School baseball team. Got in my car, drove across town that same Friday evening, the Dirty Dog Dinner was going on. That is our wonderful uh, relationship with the Bridges Foundation through our Jinx branch. And then, of course, this coming Friday night, I think it's Friday, don't quote me on that, maybe Saturday, especially with our Brookside folks listening to this, watching through video, Clint will straighten you out. But the, it's movie night again on Peoria. They're going to be trying to find Nemo. And so hundreds and hundreds showed up last time. Put that on your calendars. It's going to be fantastic. And then speaking of things going on at all three branches, our children's minister extraordinaire, Will Spoon, and his wife, Kendra, have done a fantastic job out in our foyer is one of these packets letting you know all that is going on with our ministry to our kiddos. Beginning tomorrow, now you know tonight's the big uh, splash pad event, but tomorrow music camp begins here at our central branch, first through fifth graders. In the morning, they spend time working on their musical. Afternoons, loads of fun. And then over at our Jinx branch, preschool VBS, June 13th at Building F. Again, this packet will tell you all about it. And then at the Brookside Branch Art Camp, June 21st through the 24th, you can register for all of these events online. Scholarships are available. It is going to be outstanding stuff. Well, if you've got your Bibles, please be turning to the book of Isaiah. We end up our series today that has personally meant so much to me. The feedback I've been receiving, I'm already planning my next series on the topic of prayer will begin 2017 with that. And the Spirit is already leading in powerful ways in understanding John chapter 2 when it comes to prayer. But this series on prayer, we wind up today endlessly, relentlessly, and powerfully being a people of prayer. We've been talking about what prayer is. I've got to make a confession. I should have done this at the beginning of our series that when I was a kid, prayer completely confused me. It was not only confusing, it was, you say, well, was it as a little kid a little bit boring? No, it was even worse than that, it was a little bit frightening. And I don't know if you've heard of the Christian comedian Tim Hawkins. He does a great job in letting us know why prayer might be a little bit frightening to our little kids. Let's bring down the lights and watch this clip together. The worst prayers, they gotta be the prayers that parents pray with their kids. No wonder they don't wanna go to bed at night. <laughs> My parents used to pray this with me in the dark when I was a kid. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord myself to give. If I should die, before I wake, I pray the Lord, my soul, to die. Sweet dreams. <laughs> We prayed that every night in the Wilburn household. So there are times where prayer can be a little bit misunderstood. 
Hopefully this was not representative of your early understanding of prayer. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 62, verse 6 and 7, we cracked this verse open last week. Let's encounter it again. In speaking on prayer, using the metaphor of watchmen for the city, for God's people, God says, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You, you watchmen, you need to. You who call out, who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. And as you give yourself no rest, give me God and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Let's read that again, same verse coming from the message translation where we begin to understand even more so, you know, someone says, so we're praying that Jerusalem would be established. We're praying the principle of God doing what he said he would do. Day and night, these watchmen, they keep at it, praying, calling out, reminding God to remember they are to give him no peace until he does what he says. No wonder Jesus in Luke chapter 11 and Luke chapter 18, we've unpacked these parables for the past month of a God letting us know he wants us to be that friend at midnight who won't go away, who won't give himself any rest and won't give the one inside any rest until that blessing till that answer to prayer comes. Luke 18, the widow before the unjust judge. Don't give yourself any rest. Don't give the unjust judge any rest. Day and night call out in prayer. We've been unpacking what this relentless, endless, powerful prayer looks like. Number one, let, let, let's just do a whole review a whole let's remind ourselves what we've been talking about what these prayers speak of number one we're a people who pray endlessly we pray endlessly because we have hope we have hope that things could change and because we pray endlessly with hope that things can change we don't give up we don't throw in the towel that is the subject matter of the widow's heart but the subject of her prayer is one that is relentless because she is praying for justice. That's what Isaiah 62 is all about. Do what you said, God. Be who you're going to be. And so relentlessly we pray for justice, not just because things could change, but things should change. And we don't give in. We don't give up. We don't give in. And when we're about these things, our prayers become very powerful. We pray powerfully, and that brings about the definition of what faith really is. Luke 18, what is faith? It is people who pray and engage God through a persistent prayer. I talked about how there's part of us that would love it if the widow went before the unjust judge and said, hey, could I get justice? You got it. You didn't even have to ask. I already knew. The friend at midnight in Luke 11. Hey, could you give me three loaves of bread? Here you go. But faith is prayer and defined by God, defined by Jesus. It is persistence. It's not just a belief that things could change or things should change but things will they would change with this type of faith we don't give up we don't give in and we don't give way we talked about being a people who don't throw in the towel prayer can be a wrestling match go ask a guy named jacob and when you're in there persistently praying there are times where you want to be done with it no wonder these verses are in there don't lose heart, Luke 18 and 1. I sometimes want to lose. Don't lose heart. It's a decision that you can make. Luke 18 and 8 says this. When the Son of Man comes, and this is Jesus speaking of himself in the third person, when I come, will he, will I find faith on earth? To make that more personal for us today, 
when you see Jesus, will he find faith as defined by Luke? This is Luke 18 and 8. Will he find faith? He'll find faith as I define it, not as you define it. Will he find biblical faith? Luke 18, 1 through 7. It's a question he throws out there. When I return and I encounter all the earth and you meet me one day and we look at each other face to face, am I going to see this prayerful persistence in your life? Or is it going to be that childhood bedtime stuff? Or, oh yeah, it's the meal and we should kind of do... And, and nothing against praying at night with our kids. We sh- we're going to talk about that in a minute. We should be doing that. Nothing against praying over our meals. We should be doing this. Thank you for this bread that we prayed for, and now you've delivered. One of our shepherds read that just moments ago. But it is so much more according to the Bible in persistent wrestling prayer. This morning, I want to leave you with something on why we should pray. We've talked about what prayer is. Why should we pray? We're familiar in the Bible of prayers that look like wrestling matches. I'm not going away till you give me justice. I'm going to keep knocking at midnight till you give me bread. That great passage in Genesis with Abraham praying over Sodom and Gomorrah. What if there's some righteous people there? What if there's 50? Okay, for 50 I won't. What about 45? 45 I won't destroy. What about in this this dialogue, this, this wrestling match of intercession. i, I got to be honest with you, and here's a little side note. I came across a prayer in the Bible. I've read this scripture before, but I never saw it as a prayer. Prayer is defined as someone's talking to God and believing that that has sway and effect. I'm not just talking to the, the ceiling tiles. I am talking to God that things could change, they should change, and they will change because of this prayer. And I've read the scripture before, but I never understood it as a prayer. One of the reasons why we should pray, and we're familiar with Abraham's wrestling match of a prayer, how about this one? Job chapter 1 and verse 11. The devil, Satan. But now, stretch out your hand, O God, and strike everything he has. And he will surely, Job will surely curse you to your face. Wrestling match continues in the next chapter. Job chapter 2 verse 5. But now, God, stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones. Oh yeah, of course he's not going to curse you if you you just deal with his stuff. But it's his own flesh. So do this and he will surely curse you to your face. Here's that side note. Is the devil's prayer life more profound than yours? Right about now, this should be a, whoa. Someone says, Mitch, are you really bringing this up? This sounds a little bit motivational to us. Let it be. In Ephesians, Paul would do the same thing. Your battle is not against flesh and blood. There is a real enemy involved here, and we know by his prayers what he wants. The question now is, what do you want? What are you willing to pray for? Our first point today on why we pray on the back of your handout, sermon outline number one, is because we have a big enemy. Paul said, we've already talked about it just moments ago, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Well, Mitch, that's Paul. Peter would say, your enemy, not someone else's enemy, he does you the great service of letting you know. Well, that'd be their enemy, that'd be their, your enemy. I don't have any enemies. Wrong, thanks for playing, try again. Your enemy. He's kind of after me sometimes. He really has plans that are not my plans. Your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, waiting to devour. What was the earlier verse then? What do you do about that? Be alert and be sober. Be someone, go, this is kind of waking me up. This is kind of motivating for me. Be alert and be sober. Wake up to the fact that there is a big enemy. Jesus' own literal physical brother here, not James, but the other brother, Jude, in his book says, this colossally powerful being, not an angel, the archangel Michael, 
when doing battle in a dispute with the devil, he dared not bring a word of accusation, but in the Lord's power said, and now the Lord rebuke you. Let us be people who understand. Michael understood it. Jude understood it. Jesus understands it. Paul and Peter, there is a big enemy in our lives. But the good news this morning is this. Number two, there is a big, and there's the understatement of all time, there is a big power available to your life. Amen, church? So with this big enemy, we dare not go under our own power. Here's some scriptures for you I don't have for you on PowerPoint. And so let these be things that we dwell on this week. Ephesians 1 and 19. How big is that power? This power is the same power which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. This is, this is the power that defeats the devil, that defeats that big enemy. Philippians 3 and 10. So what do you do with that type of a power? Paul would say, I want to know Christ and this power. Interesting thing for Paul. When did he write Philippians 3 and 10? Well, right at the beginning of his ministry, apparently, Mitch, because he wanted to know Christ and know his power. He wrote it a quarter century into his ministry. This one who perhaps knew Jesus in ways, a special appearance on the road to Damascus, 25 years later is saying, I want to know. I'm not done knowing. In our spiritual lives, let us grow in prayer. Let us take hold of that towel and keep it in our corner and stay in the fight and endlessly, relentlessly, and powerfully be people of prayer. In Ephesians 3, Paul talks about the administration of the ministry, excuse me, of the mystery and of the gift. Well, how would that sharing of the gospel and the power take hold and move forth from Paul? Over and over again, I ask, I kneel, I pray. Let us be people who bend our knees in prayer, asking God's same power that he exerted in the raising of Jesus from the dead, be that that lives in our lives. Let me give you three things. This is going to be, this is a free before you. I hadn't planned to share with you this morning. Three things, how you pray over people in powerful ways. Biblically, three ways that, there may be more, but I'm going to share with you, that's, that's a preacher there. Three things of how we can pray over people and that power come into their lives. This speaks especially, I believe, this morning to parents and grandparents and even great-grandparents. It speaks to those as well who want to pray for others who are children of God. You say, well, I'm not a parent. I don't have any kids. You know someone who is a child of God. And you can be a spiritual point of influence for them by praying these three ways. Number one, you pray for them. Number two, you pray with them. And number three, you pray over them. For, with, and over I encounter a lot of parents who pray for their kids, who pray for their marriage. That's great. Let us move to number two and begin to pray with our kids and with our spouses. And if you really want to get your kids' attention, catch them when they least expect it. Grab them by the shoulders, look them in the eye, and don't just pray for them. Don't just pray with them. Let them hear your heart when you pray over them. Well, my kid may not like some of the things that I'm going to pray over him, and so be it, all right? Let them hear our hearts and let us... Well, they may not hear everything I'm saying to them. I know someone who is going to hear everything you're saying over them. And let me tell you, it has been one of the most transformational things in my relationship with my son and daughter. Praying for them, wonderful. Praying with them, wonderful. And with your spouse in the mornings, praying over them. You go, Mitch, where do these three come from? Over and over again in the Bible. What do you think Ephesians 3 is? It is Paul at one moment praying for praying with, join me in prayer, and the whole time putting it in a way where they know that he is praying over them. We can't do enough of this. 
There is a big enemy out there who has big plans, and we must tap into that big power. That same power that is able to do all that we ask or even imagine. I got to share with you my rubbing shoulders. Y- y'all didn't know this about me, but I'm, I'm really, when it comes to athletic ability, I'm a little bit of phenomenon, okay? It, it's, uh, I, now, I know you're thinking maybe phenomenal in one area. I'm a li- uh, you know, there's this new point guard for the Dallas Mavericks, still relatively new. He's played for the Jazz, played for the Brooklyn Nets. But as he comes to Dallas, my reputation apparently has crossed over the Red River. And Darren Williams heard that there's this preacher up in Tulsa who's pretty good with the you know, hoop and the ball, and so he wanted to meet me. And so Darren Williams came up and he stayed in our home. It, it may have to do something with the fact that Darren Williams is now a member at the Farmer's Branch Church of Christ where my brother-in-law preaches, and they both wanted to play golf up here. I don't think that's the case. I think he heard about my reputation. Uh, here's a picture of us. Go ahead. I'd never drop names. This is uh, uh, me and Darren, uh, my brother-in-law. We just let him kind of come along for the ride. But uh, there's Darren and I, and we're eating together. We let Shannon come as well. Uh, go ahead and take that picture down. I don't want to brag anymore. Uh, th- there's one thing you should know about Darren and I. Uh, between us, we've combined uh, for, uh, well, there was the, the London Gold Olympics and then the Beijing uh, Gold Medal. Again, between us, we've combined for three all-star appearances. Um, there was that big contract last year. Between us, we have combined for all these things. We've got a crossover between us that can shake Kobe. It's a pretty phenomenal thing to encounter. Right about now, you're going, Mitch, you are out of your mind. Yeah, you may be right in that. But together, teamed up, we have that between us. That's someone who stayed in my house for two nights, and he was in my home. How much more in Ephesians when it says the spirit who wants to live in you? See, the other is a relationship of someone that, you know, met him, nice guy, thrilled to death, encouraged in a powerful manner that he allows his light to shine in a very public way, in a very public business. But to have God live in you, the same power in you, can we be people? who trust in that and pray for that. Number three thing, with a big enemy and big power to defeat him, we need to understand in prayer one of the reasons that prayer is difficult sometimes is prayer takes a big time frame. I am aware that in God's scheme, it doesn't take a big time frame. You are aware that this life is but an infinitesimal second, a blip, of a second on the grand scheme of eternity but from our perspective sometimes second peter 3 and 8 the lord to him one day is a thousand years and a thousand years a day it even goes on to say the lord how about this one the lord is slow in keeping his promises well i don't i don't like that one wait it's not done yet The Lord is slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness, as Mitch Wilburn understands it. Because my whole world is right here. And I need to understand as I endlessly and relentlessly and powerfully pray in persistence that it is on God's time frame and not mine. About two months ago, I'm down in Dallas. I meet a friend. I meet another friend, and the three of us have got some time to kill. Loop 12, Northwest Highway and 75 is a good place for the three of us to meet. At North Park Mall, I don't know if you've been there. It's a mall that cracks me up. I, I can't afford to go in any of the stores other than McDonald's. And so I'm in, I'm in North Park Mall, and I've got my friend Joel, a preacher in North Fort Worth. I've got one of our members, Alan Bastier, a blind gentleman with me. And we're walking through North Park Mall to have a brunch and to spend some time together. And as we're turning one of the corners, two sincere, loving young ladies come up and begin to talk to Alan. I've known Alan longer than I've known my wife. I've known Alan 30 plus years. And these two lovely Christian ladies said, 
can we pray over you? And Joel and I are watching this interaction, and about that time I've been there with Alan before on this one. And well, Alan says, well, what are you going to pray for? And they let it, we're going to pray that you get your sight. We're going to pray that you see today. And I said, Joel, we better go sit down for a while. <laughs> and let, let me just, my heart on this deal, I could do some theological stuff that wouldn't be that deep. But in my mind, I'm going, I, I've never seen a miracle like this. I've read about it, and I've seen it by faith. And I've seen some miracles of cancer being defeated, and I've, some, some, I've seen some miracles of baptisms, which are the, the greatest miracles you can ever see. But this one miracle of a guy not seeing, and next minute, 2020 vision, I said, I've never seen this one. So let's go sit down and watch. Because if this is ever going to happen, we've got a gentleman here who's blind with childlike faith. And we've got two girls who are in the middle of a mall. And about the time we start to go, oh, how sweet. I wish I had a prayer life like this. When's the last time I went to Woodland Hills Mall and walked around and said, can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? And so they pray over Al for about 30 minutes. And I just sit there and watch and eat my chicken McNuggets. They leave, and Al picks up his cane, and he comes back to us. I said, Al, that was nice that you let them pray over you. And he said these words. He said, their prayer will be answered. Big time frame. See, Al's going to spend most of his existence seeing and the first thing he ever sees, he's already told me about it, the face he's going to encounter. There are many times in our lives where someone's struggling with a job loss, family member is struggling with life. Endlessly, relentlessly, and powerfully we pray, big enemies, big power. But let us never forget, big time frame. God's got this. He always has and he always will. Let us be people who put our faith, prayers, and persistence in him. Today, do you know something that could change in your life? Do you know something today that should change in your life? And do you know something that by the power of God, God would have it change in your life? Would you come today to him in prayer? Would you give him your whole life as we stand and as we sing? My